Hey, welcome to another episode of Cutter One. I am your host, Jay, just Jay, your resident troublemaker and your resident culture warrior. I hope you beautiful badasses are doing well. Um, it is the day before Thanksgiving, and I hope you are all either enjoying the short week and uh, going to be enjoying a lovely holiday with your friends and family and loved ones. Um, and for those of you who may not be celebrating Thanksgiving, I hope you are going to have an excellent second half to your week and um, enjoying yourselves. I hope everybody is doing well and having a good time. Um, got another story here. Um, again, much like the uh, other story of the day, this is more of a look at a story regarding Middle Earth Tolkien, um, and it's more looking at it from somebody who actually knows some of the, knows the lore. I, I'm reluctant to say I know the lore because it, there, there's so much of it. You, nobody can know all of it off the top of their head. So, you know, I catch myself running back to the books back there uh, quite a bit. Um but, you know, I'm familiar with the lore. So let's take a look at this story and let's see what we got. All right. Um, so this is coming to us from our good friends over at ScreenRant.com. I keep saying good friends. I don't know them, just for the record. Just, you know, I, I try to be nice about things, you know. And I'm like, hey, I'm a good friends over at ScreenRant. It's like, they don't, they don't freaking know me. So, but um, anyway, all right, let's get right into it. Uh, Middle Earth was was doomed after Lord of the Rings, despite Sauron's defeat. The Lord of the Rings franchise takes place largely in Middle-earth. Uh, I would probably say the Lord of the Rings franchise takes place almost exclusively in Middle-earth, but, you know, I could be wrong. Um, with the fictional world likely being doomed due to a foretold cataclysmic event. Dun, dun, dun. All right, it says the Lord of the Rings franchise is predominantly set in Middle Earth, a fictionalized version of Earth itself, with some J.R.R. Tolkien's vast collection of works hinting towards an apocalyptic event that would undoubtedly end the planet. Throughout the course of the Lord of the Rings franchise, be it on film, TV, or in the original works, there have been many allusions to world-ending events, from Morgoth's plans to Sauron's. Oh, sorry, from Morgoth's plans to Sauron's. However, one specific event alluded to by Tolkien hints at a cataclysmic moment that is unavoidable and would have unquestionably ended Middle-earth no matter the intervention of heroes. While there have been while there have been misgivings over whether the Middle Earth apocalypse is canon to Tolkien's works, um, there are still allusions toward it in various texts and refer to the apocalypse as Dagor Dagorath. Unlike the War of the Jewels, the War of Wrath, the War of the Last Alliance, or the War of the Ring, which are staples of Tolkien's mythology in which Morgoth or Sauron threaten Middle Earth. Dagor Dagorath was often referred to as the battle of all battles and a world-ending event. The nature of Dagor Dagorath means that, despite all the heroism on display in Tolkien's works, Middle-earth, as most people know it, is inevitably doomed. Here is everything about Dagor Dagorath known from Tolkien's works and how it impacts the Lord of the Rings franchise. Lord of the Rings Dag Dagor Dagorath explained, and how it ends Middle-earth. I like the little map that they give you there. That's kind of cool. All right, the Dagor Dagorath, or the final battle, is often alluded to as the end of Middle-earth. Dagor Dagorath states that Morgoth, the main antagonist of the War of the Jewels, will rise again and return through the door of the night. According to the prophecy, Morgoth will turn the sun black and stop the moon from shining any light turning Middle-earth eternally dark. The prophecy states that this will be met by a host of Valar and elves from Valinor, after which the last battle shall be fought. Okay. It also states um, that what will precede Morgoth's return is when the Valar... Or, when the Valar and the elves of Valinor have grown weary of Middle Earth, they, they've grown tired. Um, it's it's set that far in the future um, that they they grow tired and they sort of let their guard down, and that's when Morgoth sees his opportunity um, to return. Okay, so all right, let's continue. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Morgoth will turn the sun black and keep the moon from shining, turning Middle Earth and Middle e uh, eternally dark. The prophecy states that this will be met by a host of Valar and elves from Valinor, after which the last battle shall be fought. After the battle and the defeat of Morgoth by Turin Turumba, um, Torumbar, I don't know why I said Torumba, um, reincarnated from the first age, Middle Earth shall be broken completely before being remade. The remaking apparently comes from the reacquisition of the Silmarils of fire, air, and water. Okay. Um, yes, Torin in, in the Dagor, Dagor, Dagorath, um, Torin Torumbar is said to return and use the, uh, the, the, the black sword his black sword um to ultimately he is the one that d that delivers the killing blow to morgoth um so that much is is true as far as the silmarils go um the reacquisition of the silmarils of fire air and water okay um the silmarils will then be broken and their fire will rekindle the two trees of valinor destroyed by morgoth in the first age interesting fact though is also the spirit of feanor is said to come back, and he is the one that takes the Silmarils, um, including the one um, that Iren Irendil has. Um, and if you know the lore, you know what I'm referencing, um, including the one Irendil has. Feanor takes them, and Feanor is the one who um, basically disassembles them, and the light of the Silmarils is used to regrow or reinvigorate the trees of Valinor, returning them to their their glory, so to speak. Um, so, yes, that, that is true. After the mountains... Uh, okay, and yes, and after the mountains of Valinor are leveled, the light of the two trees is said to then spread to all of Middle-earth, rebuilding it and allowing the Valar, the Valar to grow young again and their powers reborn. Actually, it is said specifically that the, the, the mountains of Valinor um, are, will be leveled for the sole purpose of having the light of the two trees spread all across Middle-earth. Um, so, yes, in that regards, that is true. Um, is the Dagor Dagorath Tolkien canon? It's complicated. The question of whether Dagor Dagorath is canon, is canon to Tolkien's works has a complicated answer. Initially, this prophecy was found at the end of the Silmarillion, with Dagor Dagorath being mentioned by Mandos, a prophecy seer. No, the Lord of Death and Judger of Spirits and Souls, um, as well as being, ha being able to... to, to speak prophecies um this was present in tolkien's original the silmarillion written by J.R.R. tolkien himself however the first published version of the silmarillion released in 1977 does not feature the main passage of writing mentioning dagor dagorath as christopher tolkien the son of J.R.R. tolkien cut it the silmar the silmarillion instead ends with something else after the editorial decision by christopher tolkien to remove mentions of the prophecy However, despite the main passage being cut, there are still allusions to Dagor Dagorath in the many published works of Tolkien. One of these allusions still comes in the Silmarillion's fourth entry. A yeah, I always have a problem with this word. Akalabeth. Okay. Guys, put in the comment section below how you pronounce that. Because I always say Akalabeth. Okay. And I know it's not right. Akalabeth. Okay. In this entry, it is mentioned that, quote, our Farazan and his mortal warriors who had set foot in Amman were buried by falling hills, imprisoned in the caves of the forgotten until the last battle and day of doom. This is an obvious allusion to Dagor Dagorath, despite the main passage outlining the major events of the final battle being cut from the original draft of the Silmarillion. Does the Dagor Dagorath make Frodo's victory pointless? One main question that rises from D Dagor Dagorath is whether it makes Frodo's destruction of the One Ring pointless. As told by Tolkien's most famous Middle-earth story, The Lord of the Rings, Frodo Baggins destroys Sauron's One Ring in the events of the Third Age, seemingly defeating all evil of Middle-earth for good. However, if Dagor Dagorath is in fact canon, Frodo's victory can be argued as pointless due to the eventual re-emergence of Morgoth. Despite this, Frodo's victory is made no less important 
As Dagor Dagorath was only alluded to in the original Silmarillion, there were no hints from Tolkien of when this could have happened. I got some issues with that particular um, paragraph right there. Um, saying that, okay, there's this prophecy of some uh, final battle between good and evil, and therefore Middle-earth will be shape, reshaped and, and reborn, um, somehow makes Frodo's um, destruction of the One Ring pointless, is kind of like saying, well... You know that your son or daughter w daughter will eventually grow old and pass away. Therefore, does that mean you protecting them for the first 20, 18 to 20 years of their life and providing for them is pointless? No, no, no one would think that. That's just, that's silly. That's stupid, right? So, I, I mean, no, knowing that the, the Dagor Dagoroth is the prophecy of what's to come does not make Frodo's destruction of the One Ring pointless. Um, I also take exception with the fact that they say um, that it seemingly defeated all evil of Middle-earth for good. No, Tolkien's very specific with that. Tol uh, Tolkien, one of the things that appeals to me about his work is that it's not just, there's, nothing is throwaway, okay? Tolkien specifically, he says in some of his letters that he kept his religion out of it, but there are parallels to a lot of what he wrote um, to certain aspects of Catholicism, um, which was his religion, right? Um, and he may have consciously not wanted um, to to um, insert any of his religion into the stories, but uh, subconsciously, certain things, certain thematic themes carry over. And one of those thematic themes is that you can never fully defeat evil. There will always be some evil in the world. Um, it is just, it is the nature of the universe. That's why he has Morgoth from the singing of Ea and the singing of Arda in, into existence. The song is marred and corrupted to a certain degree by Morgoth and his discordant singing. And so there is no perfect existence right out of right from the beginning when it's when middle earth is being put together there is this strain of destruction this strain of evil that's that that has infected the process okay and that is a recurring theme throughout tolkien's writings you see it with the oath of feanor okay and how seemingly Wanting something good and noble leads to these evil acts and and kin slaying and and so on and so forth. You know, you see it with you know Morgoth's defeat, but then one of his lieutenants, Sauron, who is a corrupted Maiar, comes in to fill the void. So there is there there is never any allusion to evil being wholly wiped from Middle Earth. It will always be there. Even even in 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 later stories, um there's there's sort of allusions to how like the world is not perfect, okay? It never will be because it's got corruption and evil for lack of a better term, built into its very essence, okay? It's like the old saying, you know, you can't have the light without the dark, right? So so I take exception with that, you know, Frodo seemingly cleaned Middle-earth of all the evil. I, I think that's that's wrong. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. Let's let's get back to the article. I could go off on a tangent about this stuff all day. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, but no hints from Tolkien. It could have happened. Okay, Frodo's victory saw the events of the Third Age coming to an end, uh, ushering in the Fourth Age of Middle Earth, or the Age of Men. As the events of the Second Age of Middle Earth were about three thousand years long, similar to the Third Age, it can be assumed that the same is true of the Fourth Age. This would mean that Dagor Dagorath does not come for millennia after Frodo's victory over Sauron, meaning the victory was certainly important to Middle Earth's history. Middle Earth's destruction proves Morgoth is Lord of the Rings' true villain. However. 
Another thing that Dagor Dagorath does change in terms of the wider Lord of the Rings universe is the revelation of Morgoth being the true antagonist of Middle-earth. Not if you know how to read, that's... no. Morgoth was the main villain during the First Age and prior, okay? After which, Sauron rose up as the main antagonist of both the Second and the Third Ages. Yes, that is true, but Sauron has always been described as a lieutenant, one of the servants of Morgoth, okay? It never... He's, he's sort of like the, the, the backup bad Betty, okay? And, and Tolkien never lets you forget that. Um, if you read his works. However, if Dagor Dagorath is indeed canon, Morgoth will eventually rise as the main villain of the Lord of the Rings universe, bringing about the events of the last battle due to his return to Middle-earth. Now, see, I again, this is where I think, you know, Tolkien's religion crept into the work. Um, again, it's not there intentionally. He didn't put it there intentionally, but I think because you know, of his perspective and, you know, some of it sort of creeps into whatever you do, right? Like some of my perspective will creep into every one of these videos I make, okay? It may not be intentional. I may not be trying to preach a certain perspective to anybody, but it's going to come through because, you know, it's part of who I am. And the same thing applies to Tolkien. Um, you can draw the comparison, and I know Tolkien hated allegory, but he, he did... Um, like applicability and and i think this falls into that you can draw the comparison to morgoth is the equivalent of in catholicism the 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 character of lucifer okay the fallen angel right um the one that that rose up against god the 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 all creator right in this case Eru iluvatar okay um so morgoth is like lucifer Sauron is the equivalent of the Antichrist. And um, for those who, who may not know the difference, the Antichrist is supposed to be one of the... He's not the devil. He's sort of one of the lieutenants of the devil. So you have Lucifer, who's the fallen angel, and the Antichrist, who works on behalf of Lucifer. Okay? That's roughly the equivalent of Sauron and Morgoth. Um... Morgoth is the original fallen angel, and Sauron is one of the angels that chose to align with him and ultimately became his, his top dog lieutenant. Um, so this idea that, it oh, well, it changes things because it puts Morgoth back as the main baddie. No, Morgoth was always the main baddie. It, throughout the Silmarillion, even throughout The Hobbit and throughout The Lord of the Rings, uh, Morgoth is always the main baddie. It is always stated that Sauron is the is a lieutenant of Morgoth. So um, anyway, let's get back to the article. Despite the majority of time in Middle-earth dedicated to fighting Sauron, such as the War of the Last Alliance and the War of the Ring, Morgoth has always been Middle-earth's greatest threat. Yes, that's exactly what I just said. In the First Age, Morgoth was responsible for the stealing of the Silmarils and the destruction of the trees of Valinor, as well as the destruction of the Lamps in the Age of Lamps. Uh, while Sauron was certainly a massive threat, he never quite achieved the feats of villainy that Morgoth did, despite crafting the Ring of Power. Because of this and Morgoth's return to Middle-earth that kickstarts Dagor Dagorath, it would mean that Morgoth is the main villain of the Lord of the Rings, bringing about the end of the rebirth and rebirth of Middle-earth. Again, that's... That's common knowledge if, if, you're, if you have read Tolkien, and that's the end of the article, but... It's common knowledge if you've read Tolkien. So, um, I mean, like I said, the, the article gets some stuff right. Um, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't knock them for that. But um, also, the article gets some stuff wrong because it's clearly it's not somebody who's into this stuff. And I, again, I, I don't know the the author of this article, um, but you know, I don't know what how deep they are in in terms of of being a Tolkien fan or being into the the. Tolkien lore in the legendarium um but they're saying they're saying certain things as if this is like oh well this changes everything and it's like no if if you've read Tolkien's work you know it really doesn't you just got to be paying attention um the fact that you're saying it changes everything shows that you probably just have a cursory or ancillary 
understanding or knowledge of it. Which, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, not everybody's into Tolkien. I get it, you know. Um, but, you know, if you're going to write an article about that, it's incumbent upon you to at least know somewhat what you're talking about. Anyway, at least have a, a, a comprehensible understanding of it. Because, like I said, some of these things are just like, well, it's like, yeah, well, duh. If, if you read Tolkien, you know that. But anyway, I digress. Um, so, yeah, let me know what you guys think, you know. Um, does the... Uh, Dagor Dagorath um, change things that much. Now, see, here's the thing, though. Um, and if you if you know like what the Red Book is, if you're a Tolkien fan and you know the Red Book, we'll put it in the comments below if you know the Red Book. But you'll know that there's this sort of... It's almost like the, the first um, alternate, alternate reality game, ARG, um where you sort of have like these like fictional stuff but plays out like in the real world because you know there is that whole aspect of the red book being found and ultimately you know Tolkien translated the red book and that's where all these stories come from it was part of that whole building the myth for for England type of thing so theoretically middle earth is supposed to be like a prehistory part of our earth Okay, which is why Tolkien sets things up in certain ways, um, i.e. the age of man and the fading of elves and hobbits and, you know, the fantastical creatures like Balrogs and trolls and orcs and dragons and so on and so forth. Um, so you, you know that all of this sort of is to play up as to sort of being from a mythical time of our earth. So the Dagor Dagorath would be you could say might have been a sort of the forgotten version of where we get our book of revelations in armageddon the battle of armageddon um which i think is an interesting thing again it sort of shows how without trying and tol some of tolkien's beliefs may have crept in there a little bit but let me know what you th think down in the comment section below do you think do you think that you know this sort of shows that how despite our best efforts sometimes who we are as a person and what we believe as a person will creep in and it sort of shapes the story a little bit um and do you you know are you aware of the whole red book thing and and how that plays out and, and you know how cool would that be if sort of tolkien without even trying sort of wrote the the sort of forgotten history of where we get some of our modern day real world you know, uh, myths and, and, and religions and, and these stories that have come down through us, to us through time and stuff like that. Now, um, and maybe just subconsciously it just translated and, you know, maybe our tales of, of Armageddon and Revelation really come from, you know, the, the, the elves, you know, prior to, to the, the age of man and their tales of the Dar, Dar, Dargor Dargarath. Yeah. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Uh, if you like the video, like the video. If you haven't already subscribed, I would hope that I could earn your subscription. Like I said, I want to do more stuff. I want to do more lore-oriented stuff. I don't want to just constantly complain about TV shows in Hollywood. I'll still always talk about major news type things that come out, but I want to focus more on what I enjoy doing, which is like the, the whole, you know, getting deep in and questioning these things and, and trying to see how they all fit together in, in the puzzle that is this great story that Tolkien and others have laid out for us. So anyway, let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Until the next time, I will see you guys soon. If you like the video, give it a like. If you feel like sharing the video, feel free to do so. I'll talk to you on the next one. Until then, peace.